my beautiful and intellectually curious love bugs, welcome back to my channel. For those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Nancy. I am an entomologist, which means that I study bugs, and I live in Ecuador, where normally I'm doing ecotourism focused on insects, but obviously 2020 has robbed us all of very many things this year, so that isn't happening, so welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm still trying to reach 5,000 subscribers by the end of December and there's not a whole lot of December left. So you can help, you can like, you can subscribe, you can share this video with your friends or your enemies or out into the internet void. <laughs> anyway, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> So today's video is a spin-off from yesterday's video. So if you haven't checked it out, it's here with the card and all the, all the things. So basically at the beginning of December, I put up a question to Twitter, to the Instagrams, being like, what assumptions do you have about entomologists? And that's what I answered yesterday. But a few of you didn't give me assumptions, a few of you asked me questions. And of course, I didn't put those questions in the assumptions video, so I made a dedicated video just for you love bugs who asked me a question about entomologists instead of giving me an assumption. So today I thought I would answer some of those questions for you so you can learn a little bit more about entomologists and entomology. Our first question comes from Parv, and they ask whether entomology includes the study of spiders. And I'm going to broaden this out to things that are not insects. Entomology pretty generally covers terrestrial arthropods, but focuses on insects. And I think the answer to this is a little bit weird, really, um, because Technically, studying spiders is its own thing, it's arachnology. Studying millipedes and centipedes would be its own thing, I guess you'd be a myriopodologist. <laughs> but what normally happens is that when you get into entomology, you specifically focus on insects, you'll get a little bit of spiders, you'll get a little bit of other terrestrial arthropods, but then you'll deep dive on insects. You'll learn a whole bunch of insect families, you will learn about their physiology, you will learn about disease vectors and all of this, these different things related to insects specifically. If you want to study spiders or you want to go study millipedes, then you'll take that basic entomology knowledge because you will be trained as an entomologist first and then be like, no, I want to study spiders and then dive into what we would call arachnology. So it's kind of a little bit confusing because you can be an entomologist and not know anything about spiders or millipedes. Hello, me. <laughs> or you can be like an arachnologist and have a pretty good understanding and a pretty diverse understanding of insects, but also just be trained specifically in spiders. So it's a little bit confusing. You'll definitely start in an entomology department because that's where the money is. So the next two questions have to do with entomologists and their fear of insects. As I mentioned in yesterday's video, some entomologists are afraid of insects, but these were a little bit more specific. The first one was, how can you have zero fear of insects? And the other was, do you still get startled when they move quickly? I've gotten pretty much past that it's moved quickly. I'm now startled of it. Now, just understanding how insects move, especially spiders. I feel like this happens a lot with spiders, but spiders kind of have jerky movements because they don't have muscles to extend their legs. They do that through the pressure in, like, they basically do that through their blood pressure. So they just kind of like squirt blood and it makes the, <laughs> and it makes the legs extend. So once you understand that's how they're moving, it makes sense how they can have these kind of jerky movements. As for having zero fear of insects, I found for me personally, just learning more about them made a lot of those fears just kind of disappear. So for example, I used to be terrified of wasps, just like everyone and their mother. I had a story where I got too close to a wasp nest and then I got chased all the way to my house and got stung a couple times. And from there on out, if it was big, yellow, black, what buzzed, I was terrified of it. Like I would just, I would literally run away even up until the point where I started my master's degree. And then I realized that it's like, it's kind of stupid. I was like, really, I'm studying insects and I'm afraid of wasps, like that seems dumb. So I really took a lot of time to understand wasp behavior. I really took a lot of time to understand why they have the sting mechanism, when they are going to sting you, what behaviors they do before they sting you. So for example, wasps can actually make a little like, not quite a buzz, but a kind of like squeaky noise almost. 
and all the guards on the nest will turn and look at you and put their wings up like and they'll th they'll even send a few guards at you first to just try and scare you before they start stinging you so once i realized that there were all these behaviors that i just didn't realize that wasps had i was a lot more in tune to reading their behavior when I did come across a wasp nest and because I've been trained in it, I also knew where I was likely to find wasp nests. So that made it a lot, a lot easier. Understanding why the animal looks the way it does, understanding why it has the adaptations it does, and then understanding their behaviors and how to read them really made it so I wasn't afraid of insects or arthropods. Does that mean I don't have respect for them? No. Like any other animal, like I really like dogs, but if I see a stray dog in the middle of the street with its teeth bared, I'm not gonna pet it. I'm not afraid of dogs, but I'm not stupid enough to pet the one that's actually threatening me. And that's how I feel about a lot of arthropods. Like I tend not to pick up centipedes either because I know that they can bite and I'm not very good at reading their behavior. Am I afraid of them? No. Am I gonna put it on my face? No. The next question comes from Noogie. I believe that's how you pronounce your username. I'm so sorry if I pronounced it wrong. But how do you reconcile the dilemma of collecting specimens and appreciation of the insect's life? I mean, I love to collect specimens. My interest is taxonomy. But at the same time, I realize that I'm killing the insects. P.S. I studied insects, but I'm not an entomologist now. I think this is a really great question. And you're going to find different people on different sides of this all over the internet. Everyone from, there's a lot of insects, it doesn't really matter as long as you're collecting sustainably and you are not like trespassing or going into national parks or hurting endangered species, it's fine. All the way to people who are like, no, this is an animal on the planet, don't kill it. I think I'm somewhere in the middle leaning towards the like, it's an animal on the planet, don't kill it. And I definitely fall on the, how is that insect being used? Are you killing an insect just to have it displayed on your wall? Or are you killing it because you're trying to understand its basic taxonomy? Even still, when you go and you take an entomology class, you have to do a physical collection because many times you need to have the actual specimen to identify it. And that's still true for many insects and arthropods. You'll find many times if you just send a picture to an entomologist, we'll say we can get it down to family, we can get it down to genus, but after that we can't. Because physical specimens are still needed to dissect genitalia, to rub wing scales off of Lepidoptera, to look at wing venation, to flip the beetle over and count abdominal segments, to count tarsal segments, to count antennal segments. And you need a physical specimen or a crazy amazing camera that focus stacks 8,000 Im images together to see in enough detail what you need to be able to identify the insect. So especially for students, when you're learning what those features are that you need to use to identify it, then you're going to need a physical specimen. For example, I taught a forensic entomology class. We had to have physical specimens. The way to key out and differentiate different blowflies was the number of hairs and the pattern of hairs on specific structures of the thorax. And even with a microscope, those structures were really hard to see. So that's one, basically. Are you trying to study and learn entomology and learn identification? That's one. Another aspect is definitely teaching. So we had a big teaching collection at the University of Georgia, and that's because our students needed to look at these physical specimens and manipulate them and move them around to count hairs, to count tarsal segments. And every year, the students' new collections that we turned in, we replaced the specimens that got damaged during this teaching process for the past year with the new specimens that were just collected and handed in. So that turnover of teaching material was also really important. But you can also have teaching material in other ways. So for example, I donated my insect collection at the end of my entomology career at the University of Georgia to the outreach program because all of my insects were super common. All of them got it. I was just learning entomology. It was the first time I wasn't interested in catching anything like particularly rare. I just wanted something that I could ID quickly and get a good grade on. <laughs> So my teaching collection was basically in some cases worthless to put into the teaching collection because 
it was just all common stuff. So I donated it to our outreach sector and they then brought my insect collection to schools, to nature events, all in the Atlanta surrounding area. And that was really cool because while there's a lot of value in showing students like, oh, here's a morpho butterfly, here's like this big beetle from Africa, here's, here's this like really pretty moth or whatever, that has a lot of value to show students how amazing these animals are. But it's equally as amazing to be like, hey, this big mantis was caught here in Georgia. You could find this in your backyard. And just having people see the diversity of things that they could have in their own backyard was really powerful. So if you're if your collection is living beyond you in some way, I also think that it's very valuable. You may be looking at me and being like, oh, you hypocrite, I've seen a whole bunch of your other videos and you've got those, all those like bugs and boxes in the back of your wall. And to do that, I say, I didn't kill them. They were secondhand collections. Those collections were done by a man who was living in Ecuador and then moved out of the country and he could not bring them with him. And I contacted him the last day he was in Ecuador and anything he had left, he was throwing away. So I thought I can give these insects a second life by putting them on my wall and sometimes I even take them out and talk to you guys about the different insects and about a little bit about their biology. You can check one of those out, one of those videos up, up here, for example. So I didn't kill them and I think that I gave them second life. So to me, that, that validates why I have them. However, it is important to note that personal collections have been historically very important. So my friend Liz, she did a project on tiger beetles because beach tiger beetles are a very sensitive species and you can only find them in certain high quality beaches. However, in Georgia, randomly, there was just a guy who really liked collecting tiger beetles. And so we could see historically where he collected tiger beetles and see how those populations match today. So we can map things like climate change or habitat loss, or maybe in the positive light, habitat getting better. So there are some cases where personalized collections have become really valuable 50 to 100 years later. So that's my personal opinion about, uh, about collections, but everyone has to come to their own conclusion on that. There's this quote that I found that I really, really like. I stumbled upon it a whole, a whole long time ago, and I think it kind of really summarized how I felt about collecting in general. And this is just my personal opinion, but this is basically, I will read the quote for you guys. And it's attributed by, to Osho. I wonder if he actually said it, but you know how the internet is. But anyway. If you love a flower, don't pick it up because if you pick it up, it dies, and it ceases to be what you love. So if you love a flower, let it be. Love is not about possession, love is about appreciation. All right, my beautiful love bugs, those are all the questions that you had about entomologists and kind of like assumptions about entomologists in general. So if you have any other questions about entomologists, I'd love to hear them in the thought box below, and I will see you all tomorrow for another almost daily-ish December, finishing up this week super strong. Don't forget to smash that like button and punch that subscribe bell, you know, all the things. That way you are notified every time I, every time I post. All right, check up here for yesterday's video about entomologist assumptions. And down here, something that the YouTube godly algorithm thinks that you'll absolutely love. All right, I'll see you all tomorrow, bye.